And one of the reasons I'm so excited to be here is that this stuff that we're talking about today kind of blows my mind. I like worry about compact fluorescent bulbs. I worry about like what kind of rules will allow installers to put a solar panel on a house, and what if it's a house that's over 50 years old and the roof isn't that strong, and all that. Do we have enough electricians anyway to do it? It's kind of those things in the weeds that that I worry about, and that many of my colleagues in state government worry about. I know that most of the discussion today we're going to be talking a lot about the DOE funding the DOE on the federal level. Uh, but as a state regulator, um, I am you know, trying to get the technologies that are either out there now, out there as much as they can be, or the ones that are cutting edge to provide the incentives to do that. In fact, late this afternoon, I'm going to a, an event uh, out in Marlboro. There's a company called Ambry, uh, which was created by an MIT professor. It's a liquid metal storage device and a battery which I think as many of you know, many people think that batteries and storage are like the next game changer in terms of how renewables can be used. And uh, so they've uh, passed some hurdle, I think. They got some DOE funding. They're opening up a manufacturing facility in Marlboro. So very, very exciting. And our, our agencies are trying to encourage that kind of cutting edge technology. I think a little bit is more small board than the kinds of things that you guys are talking about. Uh, but nonetheless, that's what we're, um, it, we're, we're what as state government what we're doing. So. so one of my overriding questions for all of you is going to be, why should a uh, government, state government, my example, uh, example, federal government, why should we be thinking about these technologies, which, as many of you have written, have big hurdles, when we have some off the te off the shelf technologies, solar and wind, some batteries coming on. Uh, so I, I'd like you at some point in the discussions to kind of address that. Why go down this path where there may be some big uncertainties and concerns where we may have the technologies to get us to uh, zero carbon economy anyway? So that's a kind of overarching thing. One of the things why that I'm so interested to be here and moderating. So uh, with that, um, I, I'd like to give uh, each of you my notes. I haven't really introduced people. I'd like to just go quickly down the table. And everybody, just introduce yourself very quickly. Name your department, or you know, very quick couple of sentences on what your uh, focus of your research or work is. So I'm so I'm Bob Armstrong, the director of the MIT Energy Initiative. Uh, at the Energy Initiative, uh, we work to bring faculty, uh, researchers, students from across the campus uh, together uh, to combine what we have as various disciplinary expertise to transform the world's energy system. Uh, MITE works with about 250 to 300 faculty across campus, so it's a very broadly uh, uh, distributed engagement uh, with the campus. Uh, we fund new research uh, for faculty across the campus. We have a big C program. Uh, one of our C projects actually was to fund the Don Saturday's uh, project with novel matter in uh, mm -hmm. uh, we, we have brought in about the $525,000 so far in the course of MITE's uh, history. So it's, a, it's a large effort uh, and a very broad effort in course of the discussion. Uh, my name is uh, Jakub Kondo. I'm a professor in the Department of the Science and Engineering here at MIT. I'm um, also a consultant for the nuclear industry. I recently served on the uh, American Nuclear Society Special Committee. Um, that investigated the accident in Japan and Fukushima. Uh, I serve on the um, accreditation board of the Institute of Nuclear Power Operation. I'm also co director of the uh, Reactive Technology Force, which is jointly offered by MIT and Apple, and it's now in its uh, uh, 20th edition. This is actually, I mentioned it because it's a high profile um, course that is taken by executives of the uh, nuclear industry to learn about nuclear power. Most of these people come in with, with very little knowledge of. Of nuclear technology, and here at MIT, we essentially teach them, teach them the basics, and it gives us an opportunity to stay connected to the industry and see what's what's going through their mind. Happy to be here. <coughs> I'm Jay Kester. Uh, I'm a senior scientist at the Fusion uh, Science and Fusion Center. Um, I'm also the principal investigator of a small uh, innovative experiment called the Levitated Dipole Experiment. Just to tell you that 
Planet Science and Fusion Center might be the largest on-campus research institute. And I haven't looked up numbers, but they're probably 200. So, um, the largest experiment there is called Alcatorp, and it's the third generation Alcatorp CMOD, but it's a big battle right now with Congress or with the Department of Energy whether to, to defund it or not. So it's a big current problem. Thank you. Uh, my name is Greg Rao. Uh, I'm a senior researcher at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I also work out of Lawrence Livermore National Lab in the carbon management program. My background is primarily as an earth scientist, a geochemist, marine chemist, and I've got into the carbon management uh, arena uh, sort of through that uh, portal, uh, sort of understanding how nature naturally consumes CO2 through weathering processes and what I'll be talking about today is an adaptation of that idea. Okay, you have to leave early, is that correct? I do have to, yeah, I meant to say I have to leave at a quarter after 10. Okay, so, so, so we'll make sure that we get hard questions. You're right, yeah. Right. I'm Ted Houston, I'm a software developer in North Carolina. I'm also a volunteer board member of the Focus Fusion Society. And uh, Eric Lerner, who's the chief scientist for Focus Fusion, is here with me. Uh, my name is Tom Blitz. I'm the uh, president of the International Think Tank of Mainland Scientists called the Science Council for Global Initiatives. Uh, most of the, our members are developers of uh, cutting edge and not compared to little known technologies. Uh, the goal of our organization is to create uh, an energy one in the world by 2050 so that 10 billion people on the planet can live uh, highly developed. Uh, uh, high, high standard of living lifestyle without uh, environmental damage. Thanks. So let's start with uh, setting the context a little bit. The electric power uh, panel here. We know that electricity accounts for probably on the order of 40 or so percent of greenhouse gas emissions. Apologies, greenhouse gas emissions in the in the country. We know that there's rapid change happening in the country in terms of natural gas fines, in terms of the potential of electric vehicles changing the shape of the electric power industry. Um, and uh, so very important sector in terms of dealing with the, the, the cause of climate change and the education of climate change. I want to give the opportunity for the, for the, the, the three experts here to kind of paint a three to five minute context of how you see the electric power industry in the context of climate change and some of the solutions. So let's start with Bob. So uh, as uh, David mentioned, in the power sector, uh, we consume about the 40% of primary energy um, in the U.S. Uh, so it's a large amount of, of energy. The, the power sector is also part of the uh, energy space or energy sectors where it's possible to do more with renewables than, for example, transportation. So it, it, it's an opportune sector uh, to focus on. Um, I'd like to make a few comments specifically about natural gas and roles of natural gas in moving us towards a, a lower carbon uh, and ultimately zero carbon future. Um, as we pointed out in our 2011 future natural gas study, uh, natural gas, uh, particularly the clinical uh, shale gas in the U.S., offers us the opportunity for a bridge to a low carbon future. Um, natural gas has carbon in it, so it's obviously not the zero carbon future, but it has half the, the carbon of coal. And so there's the opportunity through things like fuel switching. Uh, to significantly lower our carbon uh, footprint going forward. In, in fact, now, under scenarios uh, where you can imagine forcing carbon emissions down to, to 50 percent of 2005 levels by uh, 2050, um, the, the future natural gas study showed that you could get almost all the way there uh, by using efficiency and fuel switching. Uh, you get out to about 2045 uh, before even natural gas um, has uh, too much carbon. 
Now, at that point, <clears throat> we have to turn away from natural gas to, to zero carbon uh, uh, sources of energy. That means either we can use natural gas or, or coal, for example, with carbon capture and sequestration. Not at that point. Um, or we have to turn to uh, renewables or nuclear. Um, nuclear being the one of those things that we've done uh, at scale so far. There are a number of concerns uh, in, in this scenario uh, going forward. There, there's certainly this opportunity for a bridge. I think many of us are concerned that it will end up looking more like a pier uh, than a bridge. And, and that we need to be sure uh, that during this period of time where we can be doing fuel switching, and improving the switch uh, efficiency, that we do enough RDT on zero carbon uh, renewables and lowering costs of nuclear so that we have a viable uh, path to follow uh, come uh, 2040 uh, or so. So that's a place to specific to your question, David, about the role of government. Uh, we clearly need a sustained uh, significant government investment in R&D uh, to develop options and lower cost renewable technologies um, out towards uh, out towards this century. Uh, gas offers some good opportunities uh, in getting there over that that bridge period. Um, natural gas uh, offers the opportunity to hybridize uh, with possible with, with uh, uh, building uh, energies. So, for example, uh, with concentrated solar power, uh, the one solar uh, technology that has a built-in storage, you can very easily uh, integrate those uh, technologies with natural gas. By, for example, uh, the, the CSP uh, to augment the bottom cycle and the bottom cycle uh, natural gas uh, power plant. So there's the possibility to, to, to use natural gas as a way to systematically induce introduce more and more uh, uh, renewable energy into the uh, power uh, sector going forward. The other place where natural gas uh, can help is in storage. Uh, they mentioned the uh, Amberley uh, opening for their manufacturing facility this afternoon. Uh, a big need in, in the power sector as we introduce intermittent renewables is utility scale storage. Um, and, and the truth is we don't have any good solutions there. And fossil fuels, particularly natural gas, uh, can play a role as a, essentially a storage medium uh, as backup uh, for renewables uh, going out to mid-century. <laughs> but clearly those have to be replaced. So those are uh, some of the opportunities and challenges, as, as I see it, uh, and roles that the natural gas can be part of so I want to give you first a uh, context for nuclear, and then I'll, I'll, I'll address the, David's uh, question. Um, currently, nuclear accounts in the U.S. for about 20% of our electricity generation. Um, but it accounts for over 60%, which precise data from last year, 64% of the uh, uh, carbon-free uh, or emission-free uh, electricity generation in the U.S. The rest being mostly hydro and about 10% being renewable, such as uh, solar and, uh, and wind. Um, in the U.S. alone every year, uh, thanks to nuclear, uh, about 570 million tons of CO2 uh, emissions are avoided. Now, that per se sounds like a big number, but how big is big? Uh, to give you an idea, this is the equivalent to the whole uh, passenger car fleet in the U.S. So it's actually a really big, uh, big contributor to, uh, to the battle against uh, against uh, climate change. Worldwide, the numbers are are a little bit different. Um, it accounts for only 12 percent of all the electricity generation. There is a wide distribution, uh, varies from country to country. The uh, highest uh, the country that relies the most on uh, nuclear worldwide is France, with over 70 percent. You have uh, other examples at about 50%, uh, such as Sweden and Belgium, Korea 40%, Russia 20%, and then you have countries that do use nuclear power, but it's not a significant contributor, such as Brazil, say less than 5%. And here are these numbers because they give you an idea of the potential scale for growth. It is used, it's already contributing, but there is clearly room for using it even more. 
Now, the way I look at it, if you want to come by global warming, you have essentially four options. You have nuclear no which we're talking about. Um, you have hydro. Hydro, unfortunately, is saturated. There are only so many things uh, that you can build uh, worldwide, and so we don't anticipate that hydro will, will actually grow to scale up uh, to the level that is required to combat uh, global warming. You have so-called renewables, which, as Bob mentioned, are intermittent. Right now, they're costly, and if you have to add to the cost of the uh, uh, technology itself, the uh, cost of energy storage, uh, it becomes prohibitively more costly. And then the fourth option is carbon capture and sequestration. And, you know, I look forward to hearing uh, the, the new ideas over there. Um, but if you look at the four options, the one that we have available now that is scalable in the near term and that can really make a big difference is, is no one. And um, a lot of people that are at the forefront of the, uh, the battle against uh, climate change uh, have recognized that. And I want to read you just a very short quote from a, uh, a letter that was uh, uh, published just a couple of weeks ago uh, by uh, climate, uh, climate scientists. Uh, the letter is titled, Those Interesting Environmental Policy by the Post of Nuclear Power. And I quote, Renewables like wind and solar and biomass will certainly play roles in the future energy economy. But those energy sources cannot scale up fast enough to deliver cheap and reliable power at the scale the global economy requires. While it may be theoretically possible to stabilize the climate without nuclear power, in the real world there is no credible path to climate stabilization that does not include a substantial role for nuclear power. And the signees are Ken Caldera, senior scientist at the Department of Global Ecology at Carnegie Institute, Carrie Emanuel, atmospheric scientist here at MIT. James Hansen, climate scientist at Columbia University Urban Institute, and Tom Wheatley, climate scientist at the University of East Anglia and National Center for Atmosphere Research. So these are not nuclear folks, these are actually scientists. They're not random environmentalists either. These are scientists that are working at the forefront of the, of, of the battle against, uh, against uh, uh, global warming. So if nuclear is so great, why aren't we building nuclear plants faster than we can? that we can, we, we can go see. The way I see it, there are essentially two key challenges for nuclear nowadays. The first is the very high capital cost of plant. Um, nuclear plants have been uh, referred to, rightly so, for many years as expensive machines burning cheap fuel. The fuel is cheap. Uranium is plentiful, uh, and it's, uh, its energy content is so high that you don't need a lot to generate a lot of electricity. Therefore, the, uh, the contribution to the uh, total cost of electricity from fuel is actually very, very low. The machine that burns burns that fuel is a complex and expensive large machine. So the first challenge, the uh, first imperative, if you want to uh, scale up nuclear, is to essentially come up with plants that uh, have a lower capital cost, on per unit energy, on per unit energy generated. That is the key. The second is more a perception problem. What I call public perception of nuclear safety. And you know, most of the work I do is in reactor safety, so I can tell you for sure it is perception because plants are actually very, very, uh, very safe. But it's a perception that we need to deal with if we are to scale up uh, the use of nuclear power worldwide. Uh, here, too, by the way, there is a very uh, broad distribution. Uh, in the US, actually, even through the Fukushima incident, the, uh, the support, the public support for nuclear power has remained well above 50%, actually above 60%. And it's interesting because if you look at the map of the um, support for nuclear power in the US, there are very clear 60 peaks, and they tend to be where the current nuclear plants are. So people that actually live near nuclear plants tend to be more supportive of nuclear than the general public. But if you look more wide in countries like particularly Japan recently because of the accident of over there, of course, the support for nuclear is not nearly as good. So we need to address that sector concern as well. So, and I'm coming to the end. Uh, the key question uh, that we need to debate here and, and going forward is what is the best nuclear technology, the best nuclear reactor technology that can essentially address these two challenges and and uh, we have we have some ideas over here. So what can the government do? That's the last thing. Uh, it takes a lot of money to develop new technology. The Department of Energy has recently uh, committed about $150 million to the development of so-called small modular reactors. That's small. Uh, it requires at least an order of magnitude of higher investment by the government. Now that we have our buddy Ernie in, uh, in charge, and I know that he's a, a relatively uh, strong supporter of nuclear power, I hope that those numbers will actually grow. Thank you.
Jay, I think I'm just going to hold off and uh, and, and uh, move to Greg because I want to make sure he has time and there's enough back and forth. So your general con uh, context remarks, we'll come back to that. But I want to give uh, Greg the opportunity to, to show the video and have some conversation before he has to leave. That makes sense? Great. So let's, let's show um, one of the solutions that was discussed was uh, carbon capture and sequestration. And the first uh, winner that we're going to talk about is uh, Greg Rao and his team. So if you could show the, the first video, that'd be great. <coughs> Electricity is the lifeblood of modern civilization. Unfortunately, the conventional production of electricity from fossil fuels comes with a detrimental side effect, carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere. These emissions are causing atmospheric CO2 to rise, resulting in significant impacts on global climate and the environment. While a transition to non-CO2 emitting renewable electricity is well underway, fossil fuels are still projected to be the dominant source of electricity through 2050. This feature combined with growth in electricity demand means that a further 50% increase rather than a needed decrease in CO2 emissions will occur by mid-century and less cost-effective ways of reducing CO2 emissions from fossil fuel use are found and deployed. The capture and underground storage of CO2 from power plants, termed CCS, has been extensively researched and is likely to be effective in reducing CO2 emissions at some scale. However, the expense of this process and the perceived risks of CO2 transport and underground storage have proven to be major roadblocks to large-scale deployment. The plant doctors offer a simpler, safer, and cheaper method of power plant CO2 mitigation that we call accelerated weathering of limestone, or fall. It works by reacting power plant flue gas with seawater and limestone. This results in the spontaneous capture and conversion of the CO2 to dissolve calcium bicarbonate. All actually builds on existing power plant technology. Wet limestone scrubbing or seawater scrubbing are routinely used to remove another flue gas pollutant, sulfur dioxide. We have shown that all can remove as much as 97% of CO2 from a gas stream at ambient temperature and pressure, of which about 80% forms dissolved calcium bicarbonate. If this compound were added to the ocean, it would increase the already very significant natural concentration of this long-lived seawater constituent. This increase in ocean alkalinity should help counter the chemical and biological impacts of ongoing ocean acidification caused by our CO2 emissions. To conclude, the plant doctors believe that all can help to more rapidly and cost-effectively lower climate impacts of the world's growing demand for electricity, while also providing benefits to the ocean. To test these ideas, we seek partners and funding to conduct a pilot-scale demonstration of the technology at a coastal power plant. We ask for your support in this endeavor. Thanks, and uh, congratulations on uh, winning. I want to just start, and Bob, you're going to have an opportunity to ask questions or comments, but a quick question, and you can add anything that's not covered in the video that you want to add. But my first question is here, this seems to address a lot of the concerns uh, about carbon capture, but what's getting in the way? Why is this not moving quickly? Well, it's not for lack of trying, I can tell you that. Uh, we have submitted proposals to do demonstrations of this and have been declined by DOE and um, NSF and elsewhere. Um, so uh, you have to ask them why they think this is not viable and worth, worth pursuing. Um, obviously, this isn't going to single-handedly solve the CO2, point source CO2 emission problem either. But I think it could, could complement this, the, the much larger CCS effort. And there are many places where CCS isn't going to be applicable either due to geology or other issues. So this could 
be a way of uh, filling in the gaps, at least, in those situations where uh, CCS isn't going to work. So uh, uh, to answer your question, I'm not sure why it hasn't been chosen to, to go forward, uh, but we think it's time that this, this is demonstrated a larger than lab scale. Uh, uh, what, what's, what, yeah, what's your take on this, especially given your comments earlier on the potential need for CCS, as, especially with natural gas? If, well, so first comment is that uh, I think you go after the right problem. Right? Is it uh, a, a major problem with fossil fuel today is, is the carbon capture sequestration, and the big problem in that is the capture part. The capture part is, is far too expensive. Um, most capture uh, processes that we use today are, are ADE-based uh, processes. Um, and a key feature of those is that they recycle uh, the reactant that does the capturing. So there's a, a capture and then a release cycle. Which release the, the, the capture CO2 in the concentrating stream and press that uh, sequestration. Uh, so that, that actually brings me to, to my, my prime concern. Here is is the economics uh, and scaling for a once through process. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in the process you have here with with limestone, most of the red limestone, in, you react it with uh, the CO2 to form a calcium carbonate, mm -hmm. put an aqueous form and put it in the ocean. The question is, uh, how do you deal with the scale issue of the amount of limestone? Uh, and how do you get that uh, power plants if you're actually going to scale this up uh, to deal with, say, 50% of the coal plants that we have in the U.S. Today? Yeah. Well, first of all, we're not going to be able to address 50% of the coal plants because few of them, it turns out, are actually on a coastal site. So, in any case, I see your point. Yes. Uh, uh, clearly, this technology. Um, changes the equation, the cost equation from, from the capture side and, and the expense of having to recycle your reactant to one where you have a once through reactant and, and therefore the real cost of this uh, this system is the, is the are the cost of the reactants and transporting them to the side where it's going to be used. So it's a, a different cost structure. We get around this, this high expense of, of capture costs that we pay for, and yes, having to move mass and having to buy that and getting it to. So that is that, that's certainly a, a limitation here. Now, we've looked at the power plants, uh, coastal power plants here in the US. Most of them are within, say, 50 kilometers of a resource of, of calcium carbonate or, or limestone. So in theory, uh, Transport, it would be possible. Obviously, we'd have to scale up that tra whatever transport is already occurring. So that is certainly an expense and, and uh, potentially an impact. Uh, the seawater, of course, is the other other thing here. Uh, we have we use large volumes of seawater to do this. Uh, one angle here would be to use seawater that's already being pumped for cooling. In many, in at least some coastal power plants. Uh, Seawater is once through seawater is already being used for, for cooling. One possibility would be to use the downside of that, the downstream side of that, that for this process. That therefore you have double use of the water and therefore reduce your cost of pumping. But certainly lacking that, you would have to pump large volumes of water, supplying that as a as a reagent uh, or an media, if you will, for the, for the process. So. Uh, yes, uh, transport of water and limestone are the major costs here and major considerations. And yes, there are places where that's simply not going to be feasible and will be way too costly to consider. Well, because uh, Greg has to leave in a couple of minutes, I want to make sure that there are uh, folks in uh, the audience here have a chance to ask a question. Do you need a microphone? Does uh, so you need a microphone or well, it would be good, but we don't have a wireless camera. Um, I looked at some of these other schemes where you use I'm sorry, you oh, I'm sorry. When they said file, I work at the Nold Atomic Power Laboratory, but I do a lot of research on my own outside of that on various technologies. Uh, I've studied a lot of um, um, different systems. Another one that I see 
is use of serpentine stone uh, for capturing the, the carbon and stuff. And a lot of the issues are associated with, you need to look at the overall picture. If you can take 97% of the carbon dioxide out of the carbon stream, that's good. But these issues with transporting the rock and transporting the water, and, and my understanding is a lot of the stones and stuff like that, you have to grind up to find powder to get them to react. And then you also have to drive any moisture out of that rock to get them to react. Uh, otherwise, um, they, would, they won't naturally react. Now, I'm, I'm not sure about that in line. So, so the big picture is, yes, 97% comes out of the, the blue stream, but then you create other carbon dioxide. So the question is, has somebody done an overall analysis using assuming certain distances of transport for what the overall CO2 impact is rather than just what the blue stream impact is? Uh, well, uh, to, yes, we're losing, we're using uh, limestone rather than serpentine or silicate minerals because of the kinetics issue. Uh, CO2 reactions with silicate minerals is, is very slow relative to the reaction rates with limestone. So we're not, we're not using, uh, we can't use uh, silicate minerals in this application. And that addresses the fine particle size, too. Yes, it addresses the fine particle size. Although you do, uh, you, you will need to grind this. And, and it's an engineering question. What is the optimum particle size here? What is the optimum reactor? What are the optimum flow rates? All these issues need to be addressed in a larger scale uh, uh, demonstration and modeling effort also. So what, what the optimum uh, system will look like, we're not sure, and that obviously needs to needs more R&D. The other thing I would say is the bottom line here is cost. Uh, we, in our proposals and hearing from people and, and discussed here, the issues are, yeah, isn't this going to take a lot of limestone? Yes, isn't this going to take a, a lot of water? Sort of end of story. And the issue is, what are those costs relative to CCS? We've attempted to cost out from what we know about how this works a cost that's maybe a third of what CCS is in, in most coastal settings. It could be a lot less than that. It, it, it could be more than that. But the, the, the issue here is there are some sweet spots here that we think could be substantially lower than CCS. It's a much lower tech approach. We're talking about basically geochemistry here and doing this reaction. We're not talking about exotic temperatures, pressures, having to recycle reagents, all this stuff. We avoid all of that. So for these reasons, I think this approach needs to be considered um, because of both the cost and the simplicity and potential benefit also downstream of adding alkalinity to the ocean to help offset ocean acidification. I'm going to give you an opportunity just to yeah. Second, second to the last word. 30 seconds a minute to respond, and then you can have another I have another question. Oh, okay. I'm just trying to get another question in or not. Yeah. But I, to, to, to go to the uh, addition of the, uh, of the calcium carbonate, bicarbonate to the, to the oceans as, as a way to uh, mitigate um, the, the acidic effects of CO2 missiles. Um, do you have a sense of, of what would happen to the pH if you added? Very large amounts of the calcium bicarbonate um, to, to capture the scale. Uh, so, question is really the the concentration change relative to what we have today in the ocean, mm -hmm. given our experience with CO2 in the atmosphere early in the 70s. Yes, and somebody had been problem then with the CO2 in the atmosphere, they would say, no, we've got, mm -hmm. there's already CO2 there. Mm -hmm. I'm oh, sorry, you're talking about in local, not, not are you, local. Yeah, are you talking about localized? Mm -hmm. Localized? Uh, in, 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 or, yeah, I'd be interested in, in concentrations mm -hmm. today versus what, what perturbation in that uh, globally and locally. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, well, certainly uh, at a local level, the impact will be higher. We, we envision whatever benefit comes from this to, to be at, a, at a, a local to regional scale, unless there's some massive application of this technology, which we don't envision. Um, the, the nature of the chemistry of the effluent is it, it is uh, alkaline rich. Uh, I guess the solutions we've generated in the lab are I maybe mean, twice or two or three times the alkalinity that you see in seawater. Uh, interestingly, the pH of that initially is lower 
than an ambient seawater because you also have excess CO2. We're actually uh, not make, making not just uh, calcium bicarbonate, but there's also some calcium carbonate that's formed and also some uncombined CO2 in, in the effluent because of equilibrium reactions. You can't make just one thing of this, but it's predominantly calcium bicarbonate. Uh, as the excess CO2 and that discharge, or if you do a pretreatment prior to discharge, if you were to aerate that, you would lose that additional molecular CO2 that's still in the effluent, and the pH would tend to rise. Uh, if that is fully equilibrated with there, the pH of the solution will actually be a little bit above ambient, uh, the ambient ocean. That can be useful in counterbalancing the acidity that's now going on just from passive invasions of CO2. But my point is that we have an opportunity to sort of tune the chemistry of this effluent by how much we allow to aerate or even if we aerate at all. So there's some uh, ability to sort of engineer the chemistry that we ultimately put out in the, in the ocean. Now what the environmental impact of this, of course, remains to be seen. As far as I know, no one has done any experiments with calcium bicarbonate addition to, to seawater. We've done some preliminary stuff on one species and actually got either no effect or some elevation in activity of the organism as a consequence of it. But that's, that's one data point. Clearly, uh, R&D going forward must uh, address what the benefits and impacts actually are of putting this into the ocean. Comment, let's have the last comment and this and then we'll move up. Here's a quick comment. Um, actually, uh, a large fraction of the Earth's population live close to the oceans. And going forward, we're going to build terawatts of power by 2050. So, even plants could be placed near the ocean if society wanted to. And the second question, I'm wondering, um, it, it sounds like you need to create a very large industry of mining and transporting uh, calcium carbonate. Um, I don't know the dangers associated with that industry. Mining is a dangerous industry. Um, and I don't know the availability on such a large scale of mines. Well, the, the limestone is there, but yes, there is, there will be upstream environmental impacts of if we're going to expand limestone mining. So that certainly has to be factored in in the consideration of doing this. Uh, one possible bright spot here is that there are large uh, wastes of limestone. In the mining of limestone, there's a lot of waste in terms of fines and other things that are just laying around doing nothing, and in some cases, they're like a really kind of a hazard. Uh, this, in my view, would be the first type of limestone we want, might want to go after and use here because it's free or inexpensive, and plus we might actually be doing some benefit by removing this from the landscape. But obviously, once we burn through that, then we are indeed talking about new limestone extraction, and yes, there would be environmental and social impacts of that, and that would be to be understood if we're going to forward. And is it available internationally? Uh, yes, it's uh, a very abundant. It's mined all over the world. But I, I should have shown a map of the, the limestone distribution, but it's it's fairly abundant uh, uh, globally. It's used to make the road for building the country. Yeah, it's a major it's a major supply right? Yeah, it's for our first map and. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, Greg. I know you have to leave. It's about 10.15 right now. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Uh, we talked about that. So that's a solution uh, to the climate problem. Sort of, you can think of it as an end of pipe solution, end of the, you know, on the emissions side of things. Um, our next two winners are more on the production of the electricity side of things. But Jay, I want to give you an opportunity, since we jumped over you, to just give us a couple of minutes of context of how you, you know, see the electric power sector fitting into the climate problem and the solutions there. Okay. Well, fusion, of course, is what powers the stars. Um, and uh, since we discovered that in 1952 how we can make a big explosion based on uh, fusion nuclear reactions, we know that the energy can be released on the Earth. 
Um, actually, one of the nuclear, the, the people who who were involved in the hydrogen bomb project were the people who started Fusion and the inventor of the, the most successful approach, which is called the Tokamak, was Andrei Sakharov, who people call the father of the Russian age bomb. Um, however, in, a, in some ways, maybe the Tokamak was too successful, um, at least in a, in a limited way. And today, the, I think the fusion community is in a kind of crisis. Um, the big problem is that Tokamaks have a, a scaling with size. And the scaling with size is in all of fusion. It's a question of how bad it is, because you have to make the plasma very hot and very dense. And the bigger it is, the bigger the volume, and the easier it is, because the losses are, are out of the edge. Um, the elephant in the room today is an international project called ITER that's become grossly over over cost and behind schedule, and is is wreaking serious damage on the rest of fusion research. Um, I don't know how much detail I should talk now. I probably should. No, yeah, keep it keep it short. We'll get it actually up to Dennis's presentation since it's done. So, so in any case, ITER is not only hurting basic Tokamak research, but it's also hurting research and other innovative approaches that could possibly turn out to be uh, more economically feasible than, than the Tokamak for energy production. And, uh, and we'll come back to that. Great. Since we're at Fusion, let's jump into the, the Fusion uh, winner. And Dennis, if we could jump to the video. It's, it's not quite the order that we had said, but the, uh, the video is the 21st century, where's my Fusion reactor? I'm Dennis Pearson, board member of the Fusion Society. We've all heard of Moore's Law. What the best on this? To this. Well, the same thing is happening in fusion. Even a little faster than Moore's Law. It just has to get really great before it's useful. The best known fusion project is here, the thermal state construction in France. It's really big, really expensive. Not commercializing anytime soon. But a variety of smaller projects are exploring alternative approaches to practical fusion. Some of these projects were on the shoestring. Others have attracted substantial private investment. Even from golden sets. So why fusion? Well, it has unlimited fuel. No emissions. And we're worried about major accidents, nuclear proliferation, or long term nuclear waste. Projects include general fusion, Helion, St. Peter's Magic Lift Project, and Lockheed's High Data Design. Several of these projects have very broken timelines. Some projects are even discussed more on fusion. Which produces three helium ions, but no neutrons. Since the output is hydrogen charged particles, it can be converted to electricity directly. That means you don't need a steam turbine. For that and other reasons, boron fusion has the potential to be dramatically cheaper than fossil fuels. Projects include focus fusion by Lawrence Bell Plasma Physics. The polyrail, currently being studied by the U.S. Navy, like a second laser and try out. The Focus Fusion Society and Lawrence Bell Plasma Physics are asking scientists to sign an open letter advocating $300 million per year in alternative fusion funding worldwide. We started talking with the XPRIZE Foundation about fusion funds. And we're organizing a million dollar crowdfunding campaign for Focus Fusion, the smallest and cheapest approach to fusion. Fusion is not a sure thing. It shouldn't be the only climate action we take. But it is a good bet. And if 
Very hard right. It might just be close to them. Thanks. Let's, 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 let's just start with a similar kind of question. Going back to your question of where's your confusion reactor. So why aren't we there yet? And we'll let Jay have some comments and back and forth with some questions as well. Well, I mean, one reason is he's done a poor job with, with our, our research on the other time. There was, I just read a big book about the history of fusion research in the U.S. They, um, it's, it's constant good scientific results followed by and in one case we built a that three hundred and fifty million dollars in the US and And um, we've also focused very strongly in the document and instead of having solar based approach to the best. Okay, comments or questions? Um, certainly fusion has proven much more difficult than was originally envisioned and that was in the 50s. Um, so the research started in the 50s, it's, um, uh, 60, it's been going on for 60 years. The reason for the focus on the tokamak is because for fusion to happen, you need to get a large density temperature and confinement time, which people call NT tau, uh, respectively density confinement time temperature. Um, and a tokamak has by far gotten the best parameters. Um, however, you might ask whether that is the best uh, uh, way of judging as figure of merit. Um, like for one thing, a tokamak is inherently non-steady state. So if you, if you were to have, say a figure of merit is ability to run steady state or top and back would be low on the list. And another thing um, that will probably come up is top and back is well suited for burning deuterium and tritium. And that is, it has the lowest nuclear cross section, so it is the focus of the international fusion program because it's hard to get enough energy density to ignite deuterium and tritium. So it's 10 times harder to get um, to ignite cleaner fusion reactors. And by clean, I mean, I uh, guess fusion doesn't produce nuclear, nuclear byproducts like actinite, but it produces an, a 14 MeV neutron. The, the deuterium tritium reactor produces a 14 MeV neutron. The 14 MeV neutron creates very difficult materials problems um, by damaging the structure of whatever you build in the machine of. Um, and it's well, part of the damage is it activates the structure. So, of course, you have a choice of what you build the structure out of. And for example, you don't build it out of stainless So a number of people who are interested and a small minority, I should say, in solving this problem. Now, now there's a there's been money focused on materials research to deal with this problem, and it may or may not be solvable. But another approach is to use what's called advanced fusion reactions. Um, and the problem with advanced fusion reactions is you need an even higher NT tau to it. That density, temperature, and confinement. On the other hand, it might be a way of eliminating um, the material damage that comes from energetic neutrons, as well as tritium is not, is not naturally occurring element. And so, when you design conceptually a fusion reactor, you have to figure out a way of constantly generating the tritium. And there is a, a reaction that people know works that involves lithium. Um, but it com complicates the, the, the conceptual design. And in fact, in that sense, lithium is the fuel or a fuel. Um, now, can I just ask a, a quick question? So it seems like you kind of laid out a bunch of complexities, a lot of which I will admit I don't really understand. 
But what's your kind of like, so what's the comment back to that? There are a lot of hurdles that you seem to sort of put up. So what's, why is this something we should continue to invest in? Well, I would say that the, um, I mean, there's a lot of promising research, but even if you think that it's very unlikely to come to fruition, the payoff is so huge that it's, it's worth doing. And the, um, for some of these smaller projects, the investment is really not that fine to, uh, to see if they work. So, um, and the other thing I would say is that even though the technical risk is higher than, say, the interpretation of some of these other solutions, the political risk is potentially quite, quite a bit lower. You know, it might be a lot of political risk to rolling out the technology and quite expensive. Why is that? Uh, well, because of, like with the advanced fuels, there's, there's really no, there's very little radiation. Uh, there's, there's no way to use their waste. So even though you know, that's a perceived problem, so, um, and then with the boron fusion, there's, it could be much cheaper than any other energy source. So. so is it fair to characterize this if I were a, kind of, if I were, as a policymaker, um, kind of low probability but very high payoff. Is that, is that uh, yeah, yeah, at least. I, I'm not everybody would agree that it's low probability, okay. but even if you do think so, right. then uh, yeah. you should be finished, right? Okay. Any questions out here? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Dave, you said. Um, question as far as how you describe it as a probability. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> technology advancements in general are you know, are constantly evolving. You know, we used to say if man was meant to fly, we'd have wings. Mm -hmm. You know, we never thought we would land on the moon. Fusion, the development of fusion energy is of that scale. Mm -hmm. And conceptually, it's not a question of if it is possible, but do you believe that mankind will eventually reach that technology? Mm -hmm. If you do, then you should be investing in it. If you don't, you really don't believe in future advancements of mankind, because there's always another obstacle for mankind to reach. This is just the next one. True, but I mean you have to take into account the potential costs and benefits and the benefits are huge. It's energy. You know, and you know, the the possibility of kind of developing the you know an energy infrastructure that's not dependent on carbon. That's the that's the outcome of this. Um, yeah, let's go ahead. Um, Steve Boyal. I work on a large system change issues uh, in the transformation question of how do we realize that the implementation of new technologies or uh, change is going to address the challenge uh, of climate change. Um, and I'm struck, uh, yesterday there seemed to be very strong statements, which I hear all the time, we've got the technologies, um, so it's a question of how do we get them implemented. I'm struck here um, by uh, financing continually being brought up as an issue. Uh, I'm just wondering whether it's a product of the way the Climate Collab uh, framed this. Um, I see that there's three other uh, winners or next list of winners that dealt with the other issues of implementation of technologies. And I'm just wondering about the state of the art. Like, Why are we continuing to put so much attention into new technologies when um, there's so little attention that's being given to how do we make any of this stuff actually happen? <laughs> and, you know, uh, is it Dave? Uh, yeah. I mean, Dave would say because these investments will be worth it because it's big, okay. if we believe that this is possible, you can pick that. Well, that was, yeah, I was going to have, um, hopefully we can with these other technologies and and, uh, and roll up everything else, but it's a big political problem, and maybe we won't solve that problem, and sometimes humans are better at solving technical problems than they are at solving political problems. So uh, I think it's worth trying both approaches, I mean, I think we absolutely should roll out what we have right now to the extent that we can get people to do it. But if there's also a solution that might be able to uh, deal that with very low political resistance, then we should pursue that too. And just deal with that part. Yeah, well, a quick question here, and then Bob and James, and let's wrap this. Okay. Um, I just wanted to comment briefly on what you said, which was about the cost factor 
I mean, what we're talking about in this open letter, um, which, by the way, if people want to sign, I'll pass it around, is an investment by the United States, Europe, and Japan of $300 million per year. That's approximately 30 cents per capita per annum. At the present time, there are no cheap energy solutions available. We're talking about if we want to invest enough money, bring everyone in the world to a Western European standard of living, with existing technology, we're talking about investments of tens of trillions of dollars. If we can reduce that cost, for example, possibly by 90%, we're talking about an investment of a few hundred million dollars a year for possible payoff thousands or tens of thousands of times larger. So that's what we're talking about, a worthwhile investment. And uh, in our particular case, we're even more insignificant amounts of investment. We're looking to raise a million dollars to complete a four million dollar project to scientifically test our approach. And if people are interested in helping us out with the crowdfunding, there's also a sign of sheet going around for that. Let's get a final word from Bob and Jay, and then we move on. I just wanted to, to echo the price uh, comment here. Is that, that there are technologies out there uh, for zero carbon, low carbon uh, energy supply, but they're too expensive, and they will not compete in the marketplace against coal and natural gas. So we need sustain R&D investment to drive costs down, at, absent a price on carbon. It's not clear that we'll ever get below the price of these fossil fuels, absent a price of, of carbon. So at some point, we do need to do that anyway. Uh, but certainly today, where we say uh, what we need to focus on is driving those costs down. Okay. Um, uh, two comments. First of all, uh, it was mentioned that the future is low. These alternative approaches have low probability and they pay off. And there's a question, some people might say they're not low probability. Um, so it, it makes it a cost benefit question. Um, and actually, most of the community uh, does think that these that non tokamaks are low probability of working. I, I'm not in that part of the community, but I'm in a small minority. Um, in, in fact, in fusion history, initially the Department of Energy supported 20 different approaches to fusion. And um, it, it, so by natural processes, it, it turned out the top of uh, created the hottest, densest plasmas. But as I said earlier, it depends on what you use as a figure of merit for success. Um, and then another comment was made that we know fusion works, but like I started off saying, it works in stars and in bombs. Um, it works. But it has to be economically competitive. And there are examples of processes that work that aren't economically competitive. And a quick one I'll mention was a supersonic transport. Um, we started to build it 50 years ago, and we decided it wouldn't be economically competitive, and the French and British built it, and then they closed it down after a while. So in, in our economy, our type of economic system, it not only has to work, but it has to be cheaper than the competition. And, I, I, and I'm sure people have in mind that when you talk about carbon, you, you also, at some point, will get into the problem of climate change. And, and how the economics of dealing with climate change is factored into the cost of carbon. And, and, and another related issue is the cost of protecting um, oil producing areas that is military costs that are associated with bringing in oil. Great. Well, from fusion to fission, let's go on to the last presentation, the last winter integral fast reactors in power the planet. We give the video of um, Tom's. My name is Tom Woods. I'm the president of the International Scientific Impact Policy Science Council for Global Initiatives. Our purpose.
purpose is to provide both technologies and policies to supply mankind with abundant energy for the future. My proposal in the electricity sector of the climate polar competition is called Integral Fast Reactors to Empower the Planet. The Integral Fast Reactor, or IFR, was developed by our National Laboratories, which is our nation's foremost nuclear power research and development facility after World War II. Unfortunately, the funding for the project was canceled in 1994 due to political reasons, but by that time, the scientists that developed it had addressed successfully all the major problems associated with nuclear power, including safety, proliferation risk, waste disposal, fuel supply, and economics. Unlike many cutting edge energy systems, the IFR is actually ready to be built right now. General Electric has even proposed to the United Kingdom that they build two prism best reactors, the reactor portion of the IFR, in Great Britain, and finance it themselves to no risk to the British taxpayer. They're ready to do this now, and they can have these reactors built and online within about three years. In my presentation at the Climate Bullet Conference, I also plan to discuss two very different visions of the future. One is a future of circumscribed energy, where we're quite limited in our energy supply and its reliability. And we all have to make do with less. The other is a, an energy rich plant, the sort of abundant energy supply that the IFR, even by itself, would be able to produce with fuel already out of the ground for nearly a thousand years. The reason this is so is because it's a fast reader reactor, which can utilize uh, nuclear waste, what we call nuclear waste, as fuel. It can utilize old weapons material, and it can also utilize depleted uranium, of which we have in abundance in every country that has nuclear power. In the United States, we have about three quarters of a million tons of it, and a piece the size of half a ping pong ball could provide all the energy for the normal American or an entire lifetime. It's very important that we address this issue because policies will be driven by a perception of which future is possible, which future is preferable. I look forward to seeing you at the MIT conference on November 6th. Thanks, so Tom. Why aren't we on that path right now? Well, actually, we are. But, but we're, we're working now with other countries because um, the United States government is very dysfunctional, and especially when it comes to nuclear politics, it's very dysfunctional. I was um, I offered to brief the Senate Energy Committee's uh, chairman about this technology, and I was told if you want to build those, you should build them in another country. <laughs> so even though we invented them, um, we can't manage to do it because of the nuclear politics. So we're working now with the UK, um, with China. Japan, Korea, and Russia. How close is that? Uh, how likely is it to move forward in the UK? As you mentioned earlier, so. uh, it's very likely to move forward in the UK. But the UK doesn't move really fast on things. And what we've done is we've had to go in and subvert uh, an Ariba offer. Um, so it's going to take some time. China is probably the place where it's going to happen quickly. Um, and just last month, we had three high-level Chinese scientists and. Um, TV's already in talks with them, and we're, we're in talks with the Obama administration. Now, so that, um, it could happen quite quickly in China. And these reactors are designed to be mass produced. So once they do it, well, one of the reasons we want to do this is because they're modular, they're meant to be built in factories. And the outlet temperature is such that uh, this huge investment in coal infrastructure in China um, could avoid being stranded by simply removing the coal burner and putting in prism modules and you can replace the coal burner, you can keep the same turbine and everything and the switchers and all, all the associated infrastructure. So the Chinese are very interested in doing something like this because 
they would be able to eliminate coal burning mm -hmm. and at the same time not scramble that investment. Yeah, okay. Is there a response to this or questions? Well, it's uh, it's not necessarily a response. Let me just uh, offer additional uh, additional angles. Uh, first, it's true that uh, it, we are moving forward with this, um, and, and I agree. China is probably the likeliest uh, place where one of these uh, systems is going to be built. There is, by the way, a, a slightly different flavor of the integral pasture reactor, which is called the uh, traveling wave reactor, and it's being developed by uh, a private company called Terra Power, which is actually supported by Bill Gates. But they have essentially given up on building here in the US because of the uh, regulatory process. It's uh, cumbersome and very lengthy, and so they've moved to, uh, aggressively to try to build one of this in China. Uh, let me just say up front, it's not a new technology. I think Tom, you actually acknowledge this. Uh, it's, it's ready to be built. It's not new. In fact, the first uh, nuclear plant to ever, or the first nuclear reactor to ever generate uh, electricity uh, back in the late 40s or early. That was uh, a, a solid pool ring, which is essentially an earlier version of, of what Tom is, is proposing. And you can still visit it. It's a national monument uh, or landmark, historic landmark in Idaho. It's called EBR1. I went there with my family several times. It's actually a very scenic, uh, lovely place in the desert. If you like deserts, it's kind of. Uh, but for it to be successful, for this technology to be successful, it has, in my opinion, to address the two imperatives uh, that I gave you in my earlier remarks. First is uh, capital cost and number two is safety. Let me actually start with safety, which is uh, an easier question. Uh, this system, this design definitely has some uh, safety advantages. Uh, first of all, it has a, uh, a coolant that does not boil off like water does, and it does not boil off while staying at low pressure. So you don't need thick vessels and components. There is a lot less driving force for, for draining the, the, the reaction from, from its coolant, which is required to remove, uh, to remove the, the heat, the decay. Um, under excellent conditions. Uh, sodium is an excellent uh, heat transfer medium. It's a liquid metal, so it has a very high thermal conductivity. So it actually transports um, it actually transports uh, heat very, very, uh, very, very effectively. Uh, the design is is rugged, is robust. It can take a lot of abuse without uh, incurring uh, fuel damage. Uh, for example, there is a whole class of accidents that are called unprotected loss of something of medicine, unprotected loss of the flow and so on. This reactor essentially is uh, what people call walk away safe. Uh, the reactor plant takes care of itself. So it shuts down itself and the heat is removed passively uh, by, by the sodium. Historically, the Achilles heel of sodium cool reactor is the, uh, has been, and it still continues to be, in my opinion, the chemical activity of sodium. We've all done the little experiments in chemistry lab in the uh, third uh, grade or higher, right? Uh, sodium and air, sodium and water don't mix. Um, it's a manageable uh, problem uh, from engineering solutions, uh, but it does introduce a little bit of complexities in the design. First of all, you, you need to put an intermediate loop between the radioactive sodium and the, uh, and the steam generator, the water that is turned into steam and then, and then used to, uh, uh, to drive the turbine. And also, the design of the payment uh, becomes a little bit more complex than traditional plants uh, because it has to accommodate the potential for sodium fires. So this is, uh, obviously, it's related to safety, and I'm not trying to let all the safety. In fact, as I said, it has very nice safety advantages. But most importantly, in my opinion, it does raise the question of, of cost because it's additional, additional equipment and additional complexities. Having said all of this, the technology is ready, and I think the question here is not whether it's going to work. We know that it's going to work because people have built very similar reactors and they do work. The key question is, do we have the cost calculations right? And so I would actually support the idea of building one of these things and see if it's reliable and if it can achieve the economic performance that, uh, that its advocates and proponents uh, uh, claim. So I think, I think we should go ahead in the greater scheme of things, by the way, going back to a more philosophical comments that came from the audience earlier on. Um, if you're talking about a billion dollar, billion and a half, in the greatest scheme of things, it's not a lot of money. On the other hand, this is unfortunately, uh, it's a zero sum game. Uh, so if you had unlimited resources, we could fund everything. But if you have only $10 billion, you really have to ask yourself the hard question. I have only $10 billion, what am I going to invest in? And so it's, it's a zero game sum. Uh, I think this is probably worth uh, a look. Mm -hmm. Question for Tom? I think that's what else. 
I did an evaluation uh, a few years ago, uh, and, and the basis of my evaluation was similar to the ones that he mentioned, but slightly different. I, I, I said, if we were going to fix the nuclear reactor systems that we have today, what do you need to do? You need to guarantee and remove the decay heat from the reactor in some manner. It is one of the issues. And you have to eliminate all of the dispersive mechanisms or minimize them to the maximum amount possible. And thirdly, you have to reduce the cost so you can afford to build them. This, and the integral path, fast reactor rated very highly in, in that system. The one thing that it didn't do, I believe he already mentioned it, was the dispersive mechanisms stuff, the, uh, the uh, water and air fires stuff are considered a, uh, a um, dispersive mechanism. And the way that they're doing it, I have an intermediate loop and a, uh, um, in a separate structure. And in a separate structure and having an integral reactor, so you're not having loops and pipes coming off of that that you can cause fire that could be a dispersive mechanism is a, uh, a big boom in, in that area. Um, I guess uh, I guess one question I have is did did the companies put in for the DOE funding for the small monster reactors um, that they uh, that they uh, have out there? The one's supposed to be announced this month sometime. Well, GE really um, is an interesting market. Yeah. They have the design ready to build. So um, they submitted uh, the, the PRISM reactor as a small modular reactor um, at 300 megawatts, which is kind of the limit. categorized right, as the limit. So they go, OK, well, we'll do the 299 megawatt PRISM reactor. Actually, you can get them up to about 380. Um, but 380. Yeah, they want to select it, right? Um, but but they wanted to kind of have their hat on the But the, yeah. the money was but, but was ultimately, about the end. Ultimately, yeah. ultimately, they're not looking for R and D money. They just want to build one, and that, which is why we're talking to the Chinese. And okay. Yeah, that was also good. But. Short question: uh, What is the current estimated number? For the cost of this in dollars per kilowatt or dollars per watt, yeah, um, of capital cost. G, G um, testified before Congress uh, a few years back, and they pegged it at around a dollar seventy a watt. But um, but that's before you put a supply chain in place so that you can mass produce these things. Um, the people who are most involved with this design uh, at General Electric and elsewhere feel quite certain you can get down to a dollar watt or less. But, you know, we have to go build some because you need to get to the end of the kind. Uh, for the Chinese, it's a you know very small investment for something that could completely transform the country. So I don't think that's a good Can I comment though? Can I yeah, just a very quick comment? So when I, when I hear numbers like the one you just mentioned from GE, it's exactly why I would think you need to build it in home because it sounds absolutely incredible that you could do it at $1.7 dollars per kilowatt when our life advanced light water reactor is much larger, economy scale, I'm not running at four thousand well, four yeah, dollars but that's, so, yeah, but that's, for what? But that's in the United States. I mean <clears throat> the first uh, advanced oil and water reactors were built in Japan in the nineties, as you know, for about a dollar sixty five a watt. And uh, they built them in three years. Um, the eight, 81,000 so that, that China's building now, <coughs> which are going to come online next year, the first two, um, they're coming in at about a dollar sixty-five a watt. So uh, those numbers are not unusual overseas. In the United States, um, we, we it costs so much to build power plants that the ABWR, which was designed by GE, and but ultimately built first by the Japanese, when the South Texas project wanted to add nuclear reactors to their power plant, um, they asked the Japanese to come and build them. Now, why should the same power plant that costs $1.65 in Japan, where the labor rates are very high and all the building materials are imported, cost less than half of what it would cost to build the same plant in the United States? It, it's not something inherently problematic with nuclear power plants. It's something inherently problematic with the United States. Right. There is certainly a little bit of that. There is certainly a learning curve, by the way, which, which drives costs down. Um, I, I believe the numbers you're referring to are overnight capital costs, not total costs, including the uh, 
all its constituents and assets. So the numbers are much higher than that, even in uh, Japan and, and China. Unfortunately, and I'm saying unfortunately because I'd like to see those numbers come down. But again, that's why we need to demonstrate. I mean, the jury is still very much out on the economic potential of IFR as well as many of the other advanced constants that are being proposed. Question. Um, three questions. First, um, what are the uh, life cycle costs that you are our? Um, that's actually, in my view, a much more interesting question. Capital costs is a question of financing. What really matters is are you coming in at a competitive price uh, on a life cycle cost? Second question uh, what boundaries do you draw um, when you calculate the cost? Building the expanded machine, as the floor says or the full uh, uh, processing and, sorry, coming from Germany, um, Germany is just paying a, an open bill of getting waste which had been done in the salt mine against advice from all the scientific community. Nobody knows how much it will cost. It's a socialized cost of a technology and I'm curious whether in your cost calculation of the 1.7 you have the full waste stream to save in the disposal included. And the third question is, Professor, um, I'm astounded that I'm uh, apparently looking at a perceived, and I should be sure, only perceived risk in the view of Fukushima. How can you say that? Absolutely beyond my comprehension. Thank you. Let's answer those uh, questions a little bit. Sure. Um, I'm not sure how I'd answer that last question. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that was for me. <laughs> uh, I'll leave that for you. Um, uh, let me deal with the, your, your the waste question. Um, IFRs use nuclear waste as fuel. They use the uranium as fuel. The waste stream that you get out of it is fission products, um, which are the radiotoxicity declines to below the level of natural uranium in about 300 years. Um, they're in an inert form, either glass or, or ceramic, so they can't leach anything in the environment for thousands of years. So you could just bury them. However, you don't really want to bury them because um, they're very high in flat. They're, they're worth about two and a half million dollars a ton um, because the, the platinum concentration is greater than the best ores in South Africa. So what you would like to do uh, would be to just temporarily store them somewhere. And a few hundred years later, your descendants can come back and basically have a platinum mine. Um, and then you can dis dispense with the rest of the material. So but, but the, other, the other question of the dollar seventy is that including other you know, waste disposal costs. Well, the, the, what I'm saying is that the, the, the waste disposal cost is virtually nil, and the cost of the fuel is nil because you don't have to mine anything. The fuel is free, essentially. Countries pay to get rid of it. Right? So, um, so you only have the fuel fabrication cost, which is extremely small because it's a, a very, very simple process because it uses metal fuel. With the fuels we use in reactors today, they're ceramic fuels and you have to, or oxide fuels. You have to machine them within microns. Um, with with the metal fuel fast reactor, it's like you know you make a fuel pen four inches plus or minus four inches. Um, you know, it, it, it's like a Play-Doh fun factory practically. So um, the tolerances are extremely easy. The, the fuel fabrication facilities are extremely small. And uh, right now we're designing a 100 ton per year commercial scale facility that can take all the nuclear waste and recycle it into make metal fuel through the statue. Right? So that project will be done in about a year and a half. Let's get, unfortunately, we're running out of time here, and we're coming up with a Yeah, I'll, 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 yeah I'll, I'll try to keep it short, but, but let me just say one word about the... Uh, your question was actually about the levelized cost of electricity, cents per kilowatt hour, okay? And all these new reactors are coming in at around six to seven cents per kilowatt hour. That includes everything, including capital cost, owners, cost of operating and maintenance, plus fuel, okay? There are some small variations depending on design and so on. That also, by the way, includes the commission, which is built into the, 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 the structure of the, the, the cost structure of nuclear, and also the uh, waste disposal. In the US, your utilities uh, essentially accumulate about 0.1 cents per kilowatt hour every day uh, at 100 plants uh, for the so called waste disposal fund, which by now it has grown to something like about what it is. Thank you.
way billion dollars or something like that. So yeah, actually, the cost actually, 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 the government. Yeah. Yeah. The, the government is paying something. But you need to yeah, them on that. Okay. It, 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 the, the cost of disposal is not is not very high. Now, to address the other question, uh, that will be more more interesting. Um, why do states perceive the it's a perceived problem, and even in Fukushima? Now, let's not forget, Fukushima first of all was initiated. The accident at the plant was initiated by a natural disaster of unprecedented magnitude. Um, earthquake, the largest ever recorded in Japan, the second or third largest ever recorded anywhere, uh, combined with a tsunami wave. Now, the earthquake and tsunami, regardless of the nuclear accident, killed about 20,000 people, displaced 150,000, caused damage for $500 billion. How many people have died from the nuclear accident in Fukushima? No one. Zero. And no one is expected to die from it. You don't have to take my word for it. You know how difficult it is to find consensus at the United Nations. Well, the United Nations has recently issued a uh, report on the radiological consequences of Fukushima, and their projection is that no one will die, no one will die from radiation exposure in Fukushima. So, as bad as an accident, I'm not trying to downplay the accident. The accident was bad. It terrorized millions of people. The Japanese hate nuclear because of the accident. But if you look at it as a scientist, you look at the numbers, uh, the radiation doses are very low even in the uh, region surrounding the, uh, the plant. And therefore, the actual risk associated with Fukushima is, is low. But we do need to address it. Remember the first thing I said? While it is a perceived risk, we need to address it because it's absolutely unacceptable from a societal point of view to have an accident which displaces 20,000 people for 10 years. People hate loss of land and they hate disruption to their uh, lifestyle due to a uh, nuclear plant or any other. Industrial, industrial installation. So we need to address it, and I think the uh, you know the, the, the design that Tom is proposing in in, uh, in that sense is very good. I mean, the safety potential is really really excellent. So. Um, I'd just like to mention something. There's a movie um, that I, I was involved with in the making of. It's called Pandora's Promise, and it's about um, environmentalists who were previously anti-nuclear and changed their minds. Um, it's been in theater since June. It's going to be shown on CNN tonight at 9 o'clock. Um, and, uh, and, and they talk very directly. They go to Fukushima. They go to Chernobyl. Um, they don't skirt the issues at all. Um, and they discuss uh, the realities of radiation and safety and the whole thing. I, I think uh, I would encourage everyone to uh, take a look at it. Well, awesome. We're just at about 11. I want to thank all the panelists, the winners, uh, as well. It's been a very exciting discussion, and we really appreciate it. <laughs> if you guys are around, people might want to talk to folks. You're welcome to. I, unfortunately, have to leave for the next red light.